The simple fact is that I'm a Time Lord who's out of time. And the only thing between me and Oblivion is you. Hello and welcome YouTubers and Doctor Who fanatics to a special Big Finish audio review and today I'll be taking a look at The Six Doctors Last Adventure starring Colin Baker of course as The Six Doctor himself, Trevor Baxter, Christopher Benjamin, India Fisher, Lisa Greenwood, Michael Jason, Bonnie Lanford and Miranda Rayson for this special limited edition full cast audio drama. Yeah, it's really good for Big Finish release this early, which is absolutely snazzy as hell. A very good business decision by Big Finish. Yeah, everyone's been super excited for obvious reasons, of course. I am very excited to be reviewing this. I haven't showcased it because I usually do unboxing videos of limited editions, such as Worlds of Doctor Who, the novel adaptions, but I forgot to do on the last adventure. So, yeah, it just didn't happen, but... Yeah, I'm going to have to showcase this in the review, but if you want to skip it, of course you can. Because I have a feeling this is going to take quite a while to showcase. I don't want to take like 10 minutes showcasing it. That'll just be absolutely ridiculous. I'll try and go for it as quickly as possible. So if you want to go straight to the review of The Last Adventure to End of the Line, the first story, there is the time down below. If you have or haven't skipped, let's begin this special big finish review. So for the front on the release, we have full cast audiobook, special limited edition. And for the cover itself, we have the TARDIS by there. Nice 80s backgrounds. I love the background. Oh, it looks brilliant. With the Sixth Doctor, the Valiard, Mel, Flip. It's nice to see her. Constance, Charlie, and the brilliant Jago and Lightfoot. Brilliant to see them as well. Also, you might see a layer by... Actually, let's move a bit closer. You can actually see a layer by there of... The 80s background, you can see the line by there, so I have noticed a layer. I think what he, uh, Tom Iverson was trying to do was blend Doctor Who in it, but it sort of didn't work when it came out, but no, no, nothing to worry about. So for the side of release, we have the Doctor Who, well, I'm just going to call it the 2015 logo by there, as you use on all the big finishes now. Doctor Who, the Six Doctors, Last Adventure with the big finish logo by there. And for the back, it says limited special edition, including a behind the scenes disc and a stunning array of specially taken photos of the cast. Just to let you know, no standard editions of all that, it's only a limited edition and that's it. So nothing like Light to the End. Only we have a picture of the Sixth Doctor and the Valley Art by there. Directed by Nicholas Briggs, and I might as well read this because it's quite nice. A very special story which at last revives heroic exit for Colin Baker's much loved Time Lord. Four hour long episodes connected by the presence of the Valley Art. The entity that exists between the Doctor's 12th and final incarnations. And then we have a bio on all four of the stories, End of the Line by Simon Barnard and Paul Morris, The Red House by Alan Barnes, Stage Fright, which was the one I was most looking forward to out of the set by Matt Fitton, and The Brink of Death, where it all ends by Nicholas Brink. And my limited edition number is 1,191 out of 10,000. And it is 300 minutes of prox, including all the four stories, of course, and behind the scenes. No music scores or anything like that, unfortunately. Now, of course, like all deluxe items, they open just like this in this book format. And I'm going to go page by page quite quickly again. I don't want to take too long with the showcasing. But yeah, on the back, it just removes how long it is and your limited edition number. So on the first page, it just does a picture of the front cover itself. The second page, it will feature... Nice picture of the six Doctor and a quote by there. Disc one of End of the Line right by there. And these are cardboard because a lot of people with Light to the End and the Worlds of Doctor Who and Novel Adaptions Volume 1, these were made of a lot more delicate material and they got easily ripped. So now these are cardboard to prevent them from getting ripped. So Because it was really difficult to get the discs out. But now when it's cardboard, it's much more easier to get out. So that's a good decision by Big Finish because this is quite hard cardboard. Then disc two is the Red House by there. Then on the next page it is an introduction by Colin Baker. I'm not going to read it because we're going to be here for absolutely hours. <laughs> then we have another picture. That That is a nice effect by there. Tom Webster no doubt is far from being all over. And that's the continuation 
of the introduction of Colin Baker. Next one we have some writer's notes and some a montage of pictures of the end of the line, writer's notes by there, by the two collaborators. Then we have the Red House, again a couple of pictures by there, writer's notes, Alan Barnes. Then we have Stage Fright, some nice pictures there, and the writer's notes. And then the final story, The Brink of Death, with the writer's notes from Nicholas Briggs. Next page we have The Valiard looking pretty awesome by there, with a nice quote by there. And then we have Producer's Notes by David Richardson. And then on the next couple of pages, it will show the behind the scenes picture. So there's Colin Baker, Miranda Rayson, India Fisher, Lisa Greenwood. And then we have Colin Baker and Michael Jason together. I really like this. That's a good old picture. I like that one. Then Bonnie Lamford, The Valiard, Michael Jason on his own. Then we have some of the supporting characters from, looks like the Red House. Next one is Stage Fright. And yeah, Lisa Bowman plays Ellie in this one. And then this one is supposed to represent the brink of death. And the next couple of pages, nothing really to talk about. It's just production credits, the cast featured in the story. And then we have the best page of them all, a nice montage of all different characters from each of the stories by there. Really like this. Tom Webster's done it through all the releases of the deluxe items, and this is a great one. Then we have another picture of the last adventure front cover, part three, or episode three. Stage Fright with disc. And then we have part four where we can see the regeneration. And also did that on the disc, so nice detail and attention to detail. And then on the final page, it will be behind the scenes by there. So that was the last adventure showcase. Now to the big stuff, of course. The main reason why you're watching this video is for the review. It may look snazzy and absolutely gorgeous, but the story content has to be there. Otherwise, what's well, not good? It may look lovely, but inside it's not but anyway that's what i'm going to say right now so let's get to the review part of this video with the end of the line i can see something something a shape over there when the fog thinned for a second come on so the end of the line features the companion constance clark who is a new six doctor companion right by here played by miranda Rayson, and her first big finish story as a companion is crisscross i think that's quite good we have more of a later story so we know a bit about constance clark in this one and yeah we do i get to that when i'm talking about the characters so yeah this story is written by two collaborators which is simon barnard and paul morris they've written a series nine one i think it was the island of death they've done beneath summerfield ones and also they did a single companion chronicle but the first thing they did was write Big Finish short trip books. So to the summary of the story, the Doctor, Constance and many other characters in this audio have been sent to a place of nowhere with no explanation why. And this one is set on a train where fog surrounds it all. They need to gather up themselves and try to find a way out. So you can tell it's a story with good old atmosphere. I love those type of stories. So we begin the, the in-depth review. And it goes all the way through, there's no part one or part two, no cliff around in the middle, it just goes the full 60 minutes, and that's it. And the end of the line is the fat is the, well not the fastest, the longest audio out of them all, it runs on 12 tracks, while the other ones are 10 tracks, so it is the longest story. But anyway, part one, I love the pre-title sequence, as it tells a lot about Constance's companion, as she can really put herself in harm's way. So she can risk her own skin to save others in danger. So we can see a very brave companion. So immediately, there's something to like about Constance right from the get-go. So that's great. So most likely in Criss Cross and the other stories, she would be putting herself in harm's way in dangerous situations. So yeah, a lot has been said about Constance's companion. There's even more to come, but that's later on in the story. This story does set up very well. With absolutely no answers, no explanation of what's going on. They're in a place of nowhere, has some brilliant atmosphere and mystery. Because they don't really know precisely where they are. Actually, come to think of it, talking about nowhere, I think this story does do a slight nod to Nicholas Briggs' The Nowhere Place. Because that's in, well, that takes place in a place of nowhere. And in that story, it features a train. So I think the two collaborators did a, a very sneaky nod 
to the nowhere place. So yeah, back on track, I got distracted by the nowhere place. Anyway, backtrack. So yeah, they're to the point, there's no explanation at all as the Doctor Constant and these other characters are in the same situation. I have no idea where they are. So when all these characters find themselves and get onto this train, they all have great interactions. Some of them, it's quite realistic the, the interactions with each other. Uh, one called Norman is very strong to his job, talking about health and safety and all like that, protecting the passengers. And one of them, Hillary, who's scared out of her wits, don't know where she is, and plays the part very well. So yeah, the uh, interactions and how they act in this situation, I find it quite realistic from the start. But I will say the characters are average, there's nothing special happening at this moment, they're just interacting, oh my god, where are we? You know, it's just that sort of stuff. So nothing interesting with characters at this moment. The only thing we're focusing on is, where the hell are they? So yeah, characters at this moment, average. However, there's always a however, it gets quite odd when it goes along. Anyway, Hillary explains that she's very afraid and soon says that someone has been killed. And this does cause quite a debate with all the other characters in the train. But then says something very shocking and pretty creepy. But yeah, I found it just very, very creepy to be honest. And that's where the story kicks in, it snaps in. You can feel atmosphere starting to build up and the creepy music is brilliant which speeds up and it delivers tension. I believe Howard Carter did the music, don't quote me on it. If I'm wrong, I'll place the music person by here. But yeah, fantastic music. Works with the scenes perfectly. So yeah, as it carries on, the characters, they change their personalities. They feel completely different. Some of them turn very mental and psychotic. But yeah, as all the creepy stuff sort of happens, that's where the atmosphere kicks in and the story is very interesting. But even though there was good stuff happening, in the middle half, I would say, in places it felt pacing issues a little bit. This might just be me, but I just wanted the story to hurry up a little bit. So I'm not sure who would agree or disagree on me, I, I don't care what you do. But yeah, that's just personally me. But yeah, it gets, it gets going back in, I'll say, the three quarter mark. And then does deliver some creepy background effects of screaming in the background. Again, the Nowhere Place does that as well. Uses quite a lot of elements from that story. Oh, and I gotta say, there is a fantastic twist in this. Just right out of the blue, something happens. You think, oh my word, I did not imagine that. That is unbelievable. Yeah, something really good happens in this story. I won't say what it is. It will blow your socks off, believe me. Yeah, the two collaborators did very well with that. That was brilliant. And it does a nice nod to someone. If you, if you listen to it, you know what I'm talking about. Now that was my, I would say, look of the entire story. Now we go through the characters featured in the story with the main cast. We'll start with the good old Sixty himself, the Sixth Doctor, Colin Baker. He is great in this first story. He captures... A lot of his Doctor is brash shy from the TV series and it is charming and relaxing, which is his big finish side. What I mean by brash, he feels like he wants to maintain that leadership. He's the big bad boss around here. He's telling what everyone's going to do on the train. And I like it. He gives authority to Constance as well when he's away. So these two pairing are very good because they both like leadership, these two. See, the Doctor is brash to the supporting characters and maintaining that leadership but very nice and loving to Constance they work so well together it feels like this is a story later on than crisscross so yeah I like the interactions of them so they both work brilliantly six doctor is magnificent as i said now Constance Clark there's quite a lot of stuff with Constance i like it i've said about her going in harm's way don't need to repeat myself with that another thing which i find quite interesting Constance can be a little bit brash. Not rude in any way, but something quite interesting. Likes to test the Doctor a little bit, I would say. And Constance said a line like this, The TARDIS never seems to land us anywhere but somewhere completely random. And the Doctor's reaction to this is like, Huh. Seems like Constance is testing the Doctor a little bit, so that's quite interesting, I guess. And another thing I expected this, Constance wants to be treated with total respect. 
and like a lady. As the doctor said, I am the doctor and this is Constance. And then she, and then Constance interjects the doctor saying, Mrs. Clark. So yeah, wants to be treated with respect. Yeah, Constance is very likable and I like them two together. Now supporting characters, I can't go too in depth with them. Because they do change quite a lot in the story. With different personalities and all like that, so I do have to restrict with the spawning characters, but I'll be brief as possible with them. Norman, which is Hamish Clark, is the character who is protective over passengers with health and safety and all that. Seems to be quite unsure about the Doctor though, doesn't really trust him, so that's quite interesting. Tim Hope, Anthony Howell. I actually quite like this character, I don't know why, because he wasn't really too focused that much through it. But there, is, uh, there are some interesting stuff I won't go into. Then Keith Potter, which is Chris Flinley. I would say good performances again. However, I'm not going to go into his character. And the other two, which is Alice Lloyd and Hilary Ratchet. Anya Yuhari and Maggie Service. Yeah, Alice Lloyd, something interesting happens where she becomes a little bit mental and she plays that part brilliantly. And then Hilary Ratchet. She's a character who is scared from the start in the situation she's in, but the line she says is really where the story kicks in and becomes very creepy. So the final verdict on the end of the line, it is a very interesting but wonderful start of having the setting of the nowhere place with a story very easy to follow in my opinion, but the complicated stuff is with the characters, so I would recommend giving it a second shot if you find all the stuff of the characters a bit a bit confusing. The end of the line, I think it gets a 9 out of 10, a strong story by these collaborators. Now I've talked about the end of the line for quite a bit now, and I'm not sure how long I've been talking about it. So I, I have no idea how long this review is going to be. Hopefully it won't be too long, because I, I still got three more stories to talk about. Anyway, move into the Red House. Ah, big Red House on the hill, I see it. Well, it's a possibility, I suppose. Odd, though, that there's no one about. So, The Red House, this story features the companion Charlotte Pollard into the set, and I haven't listened to a Six Dodge and Charlie story since a, over a year ago. I listened to Patient Zero, and I remember liking them two together. But honestly, I just can't really remember how they interact with each other, so it's completely gone out of my head. Yeah, I like Charlotte Pollard, I did like her with the 8th Doctor. But honestly, I didn't think too much of this story. I think the trailer put me off of werewolves. They didn't remind me of the classic werewolves I know and love. Good old Hammer Horror ones. So they weren't werewolves which I love. Just werewolves completely different. But anyway, the summary of the story, the Doctor and Charlie land on a world which is inhabited by werewolves. And both the Doctor and Charlie have to be very careful with their surroundings. And then later on, we have an insight about the Red House and the Doctor Painton. So let's begin the in-depth review of the Red House. Now, quite surprisingly, I know I'm a bit of a pessimist when it comes to Alan Barnes, but the story opens up quite promising. The Doctor and Charlie, like as they said, landed on a planet inhabited by werewolves. I can't seem to recall the planet's name. I'm not sure if it was even mentioned, but if it was, I can't remember, I apologise. So right from the bat, he gets into the action, where the werewolves are chasing the Doctor and Charlie, which delivers quite a tension-building scene, I would say. It would be better if the music had a, like a cello going faster and faster, or a piano, that would be brilliant. But still, wonderful nonetheless, I like the opening part of the story. So very early on, there's a lot of things I actually quite like about it, such as the many references to the Eighth Doctor adventures where Charlie was traveling with the Eighth Doctor. Sixth Doctor's like, well, what, what on earth are you on about? Because of course he hasn't lived the Eighth Doctor yet, but Charlie has traveled with the Eighth Doctor. So yeah, I love that references. I think it's one of the best scenes of the story. I just love that. Now I'm going to be talking about the Valiard. I haven't talked about him yet, so might as well, because he is in this story. So when the Valiard gets into the story, this is where I really had my ears on it. It was very interesting and good when Charlie was interacting with the Valiard as he was covered up. So that's some really interesting interactions and you can still tell he's very, very taunting. 
And I do love Michael Jason's laugh with the Valyard. It's, it's utterly brilliant. <laughs> Another point, this is about the Valyard in all the stories. I like how he's used in the entire set. The end of the line seems like it's getting everything ready, starting it up. Then the Red House, he had more of a role. And then so on and so forth, stage fright even more, bring a death even more. So I like how he's used. He's used more and more as the set goes along. As he gets more better, stronger, powerful, taunting, intimidating. Really like that. So we got all the cool and brilliant stuff out of the way. Such as the Sixth Doctor, Charlie and the Brilliant Valiard. What about everything else? Well, it turned out... Average. The story had no solid premise to me and didn't really work out that well. I really cannot take the werewolves seriously at all. It's not my cup of tea how they're portrayed. It's just not werewolves to me. They're too comical, not intimidating by any means, and the Valiard's brilliance, as I should say, literally just pushed them away. I had too much attention on him. The werewolves were just bland. Yeah, I just don't like talking werewolves, I just find it too silly in my opinion. I know it's so not really to take seriously, but it's just not my cup of tea, I'm afraid. Also, the plot was a bit up and down for the most part. I didn't enjoy the storytelling, and the ending, it just felt rather average. That is a weakness of this, the story. That's not good. Now, what about a story highlight? It does have highlights, such as... Charlie referencing those of Ape Doctor stories and the Six Doctors like what on earth are you talking about? That's definitely a highlight for me and also with the Valiard having doing a brilliant performance. Absolutely incredible. So yeah, Michael Jaston betrays him well. So that was my in-depth look of the Red House. Now I'll be going over characters and performances. Started with the main cast, the Doctor. Brilliant again, I'm always gonna say that about good old Sixy, of course. I did prefer him in End of the Line though, I gotta be honest. However, there were still some funny scenes here and there, such as he's very protective over his coat, and that was a great scene. Also, I might add that Six Doctor and Charlie do very good tactical plans with each other, I think that's great. They had a really good plan in this story, which I thought was very clever. Yeah, they do some really good plans together, they do, so I like that. Well, anyway, Charlie. Yeah, it's been a while since I've listened to an audio of hers, that's including an 8th Doctor one as well. I did enjoy her in this story, she is very brash in this story, especially to Dr. Painton. And also very feisty, threatening to punch Dr. Painton on the nose, which is very similar to Molly in Dark Eyes 1 threatening to punch the Doctor on the nose. So yeah, pretty feisty in this story. Now the Valiard, I'm going to count him as main cast. The best performer in this story, I absolutely love him at the start when he turns up. And is very taunting. But I said a great positive about this release. It has a bigger role when each story goes. Bigger and bigger and bigger. So it only gets better for the Valiard. He's my favourite performer in this story by a long shot. I just love the Valiard. Michael Jason. Perfect. Now supporting characters. <sighs> now unfortunately. I didn't like them to be honest. Anyway let's go from Hugo which is Rory Keon. I can't take this character seriously for one minute. I found him really annoying. The way he was characterised, his personality, I hated it to be honest. I'm not talking about the performer, he's fine, but I really did not like the character. So Dr. Painton, which is Andre Bernard, also played Constable, I think, or one of the werewolf characters. Yeah, more ties into the Red House, so I won't go too far in that. Honestly, the rest of the characters, I just didn't really care about. I didn't really like them. Supporting characters is another weakness of this story. I think the Valiard just pushed them away. I had too much attention on him. But yeah, Constable, Sergeant. Yeah, Constable, Sergeant, Lina, Dennis. Um, really caring about them, to be honest. Yeah, I didn't really care about them. So what is my final verdict on the Red House? The story... It just tries too hard, doesn't it? It wants to be the jewel in the crown, pretty much. The best out of the set, but it doesn't work. Alan Barnes is always like this, and this is why I'm not really a big fan of his writing. He always wants to have the standout when he did it with Last of the Cybermen, but it didn't stand out. Yeah, to be honest, his work isn't my cup of tea. A lot of people said this story didn't have big potential and looked very good on paper, but the way it was executed failed. I would say both. If I read the script, I wouldn't like it. Talking werewolves, betrayed, 
wouldn't like it, the story and plot had pacing problems and the supporting characters were unlikable. So I don't think I do like the look of it on paper. I've seen a lot of ratings with 5 out of 10, 6 out of 10 and the old person giving it an 8 out of 10. I haven't seen anyone said this is the best story from the set yet so there's probably someone out there. Because of course everyone's entitled to their own opinions. This may be some people's cup of tea but it's not my cup of tea. My rating is straight down the middle, it's a 5 out of 10 for me. Yeah, for me, all I can say is I'm just not a fan of the story, it's just average. It would get a 4 out of 10 if it wasn't for the Sixth Doctor, Charlie and the brilliant Valiard. If they weren't in it or didn't have a good role, then oh dear me. Yeah, I think this disproves that I'm just not a fan of Alan Barnes' stories. So that was the Red House, now we we'll be moving on to the third and the penultimate story from the set. Now I'm not sure how long it's going to be this review, so if it is getting quite long, I insist you have a break, you don't have to watch the whole thing in one go. But anyway, let's move on to the third story of the set, Stage what? Fright. Do you remember all your regenerations, Doctor? The fear, the grief, the confusion. I do. Now to the set, this was the one I was most looking forward to. I was optimistic that Matt Fitton would deliver a cracking good story, and this one features Flip, who I really like Flip as a companion, she's great, so I enjoyed her in The Curse of Davros, and that's the only audio I've listened to of her, I don't have any of the, oh I have Scavenger, but I haven't listened to it, but it's a second one, and I like, I just like, oh yeah, Crimes of Thomas Brewster, that's another one, so yeah I've got quite a few stories featuring her, but yeah, she's really likeable, and of course, the amazing, Christopher, Benjamin, Trevor Baxter, J.U.N. Lightfoot. So to the summary of the story, it opens up with the Doctor deciding to take Flip to the 18th century London to see the theatre, and the two characters, J.U. and Lightfoot. Also, the Valiard is using a cover-up name. This is brilliant. Timothy Yardvale. And it is mentioned why he didn't cover up his name, less obvious. But yeah, it's explained why he calls himself Timothy Yardvale, because Yardvale just swap him around. Valiard, Yardvale. And Timothy Yardvale is performing theatre, which are recreations of the Doctor's regenerations. And by this, it seems like he is sending a message to the Doctor in a very taunting and intimidating manner. So yeah, very nice opening premise of this story. So now we will go into the in-depth look at Stage Fright. I have to start it off with Flip is brilliant as a companion. She's just so likeable in this story and all the other stories to be honest. She quotes a lot of different sort of TV shows and all like that. As she is in 18th century London in the Victorian times so she calls it Victorian X Factor. She quotes Harry Potter, Star Wars. I love it when Flip calls the Valley on Darth Vader. That's brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, so Flip is, I actually find myself quite laughing a lot. She's just very well written, so I like Flip a lot. But also explores her character very well. And she does have glossophobia, which is a fear of standing up to a crowd and performing in front of a crowd. And she had a very bad experience in the past. So this story really focuses on Flip. I think out of any story, she, def she definitely gets a lot of content in this one. It's also brilliant that Flip gets along with Jago and Lightfoot. I actually didn't have a clue how they would interact with each other to be honest but you know I really liked it and they do get split up where the Doctor goes with Lightfoot and Flip is with Jago so they have a bit of interactions with each other which is quite nice as the Doctor and Lightfoot are doing something else. Also this story has some very dark moments I would say. A lot of dark elements and I'll go for one of them now and this is with the Valiard. And I do love how the Valiard sends type of message to the Doctor and you can really find out how truly evil he is. As you can see dead and dried up husks and their clothing is very similar to the Doctor's companions. I do find it's a very extremely powerful scene as it feels like the Valiard is mocking the Doctor that you've left your companions behind and some are dead because of you. Yeah I really like the Valiard, he really strikes the Doctor right in the heart. So we are dealing with very dark storytelling. Very good with the Doctor and the Valiard. Now you're probably worried about something. If you know Jago and Lightfoot, those brilliant characters, 
they do deliver like comedy to stories. Because I've listened to the Jake and Lightfoot audios and they always bring brilliant comedy and they do in this as well. But even though this story has dark elements, will Jago and Lightfoot like comedy damage the dark elements of the story? Well, no, they don't. Matt Fitton has done some sensational writing as the light-toned characters Jago and Lightfoot do not diminish the dark elements of the story. And that is a tough job to do, that is, but well done Matt Fitton, that is some very cracking good writing talent. Yeah, I've mentioned this before with We Are The Daleks, as I was quite worried that the seventh Doctor being quite close to season 24 would diminish the dark elements of We Are The Daleks. And this competed the same thing with this, with Jago and Lightfoot perhaps diminishing the dark elements of stage fright, but it doesn't. Good stuff by Matt Fitton. Now I have to talk about the Valiard in this one, I have to explore him. He can very easily use people for his own needs and manipulate them. Yeah, that's some good stuff. Now I'm going to cover the theatre parts of the story, and this is where it gets absolutely incredible. Where the Valiard is recreating a Doctor's final moment, and there's one where they do the second Doctor one with Zoe and Jamie, that's really nice. Don't worry, don't go too far, it doesn't have Jamie and Zoe in the story. And coming up, it leads into one of my favourite Big Finish Doctor Who moments ever, the Battle of the Time Lord Brains. The music really fits the Valiard, it feels dark, evil, negative, and mysterious. All those words, thanks to the Valiard. So music, it feels like the Valiard's theme, it does. It does show that the Valiard isn't easy to beat at all. And he knows all the Doctor's movements and where to strike him right in the heart in his weak points. He can really get into the Doctor's head and taunt him. Yet, yeah, ah, part of the story, the Doctor feels completely powerless against him. I honestly think the Valiard is... One of the best villains to go against the Doctor because the Valiard knows everything about the Doctor and we know very little about the Valiard. So much mystery surrounds him. So I love the Valiard. And also at the end of the story, a fantastic cracking speech by the Sixth Doctor about theatre, which is another highlight of the story. So now we go to the main cast, I have no need to cover the Valiard. I don't really need to do flip as well because I've done that as well about who explored a lot more as a character about her fears. But yeah, the Doctor is brilliant when he confronts the Valiard, as I said, the battle between the Time Lord minds. And the Doctor feels so hopeless against him. Also, there are connections with the Red House and this one, so I would say you have to listen to it in order. Yeah, and story-wise, they are separate, but they do have connections. Supporting characters I don't really need to cover because they're not really the big focus and just in the theatre and that's it, except for Ellie, who is voiced by Lisa Barman, who does a great voice. So overall, Stage Fright is one of my favourite Big Finish audios I've listened to. I really, really enjoyed it. I had a feeling that this one would be the best in the set. We don't know that just yet because I haven't done the brink of death yet. But this one is just remarkable. Actually, I was overwhelmed. It was better than I expected. Because some of the scenes were so good and was very dark in places, which I didn't expect all these dark elements to come up. As I thought it was going to be quite a light-hearted story featuring Jago and Lightfoot, but yeah, it is. Uh, got a lot of dark elements in it. Overall, yeah, this is Matt Fitton's best work by a long shot. So credit to him, he did absolutely fantastic. Definitely his best story. I'm not sure what I would rate it. I've been struggling. 9.5 or 10. I really don't know which way I want to go with it, so I guess a third listen may help me there, but honestly, I don't know which one to go for. I can't go 9.75 because that's ridiculous, but I'm just going to leave it there because I don't know which way to go. But you can tell I really enjoyed it. Now to the final story of the set, The Brink of Death. How are you doing this? How am I doing this, Doctor? Wouldn't you like to know? Soon. There will be virtually no limit to what I can do. So The Brink of Death was written by Nicholas Briggs and a lot was on him. We were hoping that this one would be a great story and memorable from the set. As it is his last adventure. Now to the summary of the story. It is very different from the other ones and does jump into a very epic scene at the start. 
and it does jump around a lot, it does. And what I essentially mean by that, it starts off pretty confusing, you don't know what on earth is going on, so quite similar to End of the Line, I guess. And will be resolved later on. And of course, this is the final story in the set, and the Doctor's and the Valiar's biggest confrontation. So yeah, I did mention that this story starts out confusing, you don't know what's going on with no explanation, but also the Doctor's confused at the same situation. He doesn't know what's going on. But I will find this isn't really of a complicated listen. I actually found it quite easy to listen to, honestly. I'm not sure what other people would say to that, but I found it quite of an easy listen. So what about the Valyard? He actually jumps into the story very early and playing a very interesting role and makes you think, what on earth is he up to? And at the same time, something happens to the Doctor, he's affected and ends up in the Matrix. And this is what this story mostly focuses on, is Matrix and all like that. And that's where the main story starts off with the introduction of a character named Janesta, who I, I actually like her, I do. And at this point, a clock is ticking down and we know the Doctor's time as the sixth Doctor incarnation is about to end. See, the Doctor and Janesta have great interactions, uh, and not a lot with Mel, because she's mostly pushed aside. Mel's doing something else I don't really want to talk about. But Mel is only in the start of it, and the end of it. So that's pretty interesting, but I can't say I don't really dislike that, because I like the Doctor and Janesta having their interaction, so I think I, I forgive that, to be honest. See, I like the sixth Doctor and Janesta. Also, I like that the Doctor says she's very similar to himself. Though. See, I like the Sixth Doctor and Janesta. Also, I like that the Doctor says she's very similar to himself. Though. So I quite like that. Some nice chemistry going on. Yeah, the Valiar does have the most listening time in this audio than all the other ones. He is betrayed brilliantly again and does trick the Doctor many times without him noticing. However, what about the confrontation? It wasn't as good as stage fright, i got to be honest, which is a bit of a shame, it has to get better as it goes along, but still the Valiard had plenty of fantastic stuff in the story, but I wanted a bit of a battle, if you know what I mean, but what I'm trying to say, it's not as good as the stage fright one at the theatre. It's also quite nice where the Doctor does take a strike at the Valiard, which is quite interesting, and does show a side to the Sixth Doctor, which I, I like, I do. It also grabs many elements to other regeneration stories, such as the Tenth Planet, the War Games, that's always a good thing to do, Caves of Androzani, Night of the Doctor, it does sound quite lovely with that. I have to talk about the Night of the Doctor one, because that is just beautiful. I love when the Sixth Doctor lists all his companions he has travelled with. It's just a, such a beautiful scene, I love it, and I love it. When he says Evelyn, it's just, oh, chills went right through me. And that scene feels to give much respect to Maggie Stables, who has passed away, which is a great shame. She had a long-term illness. I think, yeah, a lot of people who are Six Doctor fans and listen to an Evelyn story will say they're just the best together and were the definitive pairing. So the regeneration or the last adventure, Brink of Death, this does go into time in the Rani and doesn't rewrite anything so it does look like it's paying a lot of respect to the classic TV era and I like it I like it but what about the final scene where the seventh doctor makes an appearance I think it's a nice touch I do I really like it as it tells that the doctor's story will continue and he'll live on so I, I like that scene at the end I personally like it where the seventh doctor comes into the picture so I'm not going to go too much further into the ending scene or anything like that. I believe someone's uploaded it on YouTube, so do it if you wish. But yeah, I do like the last scene featuring the Sixth Doctor. It feels emotional in some places. And it feels like an end of an era, it does. Good old Sixy. Now what about supporting characters? Well, they're used for a purpose, which I sadly cannot cover because it will be spoilers. All performances were good, of course. Someone else might cover these characters in their own review, but I've decided not to. Now, what is my final verdict on the brink of death? It's a really good end for the Sixth Doctor. There we go, that's what I wanted to hear, and that's what you wanted to hear. It's a great end for him. Some people have found it complicated, and have only listened to it once, and they said, oh, I don't get it, I need a second shot. 
I listened to it once and I found it very easy to follow it. I didn't find it confusing whatsoever. That might just be me. It's different with all people. And I will give it an 8 out of 10. A good old positive rating for the brink of death. That's why I wanted to give it. Because 8 out of 10 is a very high rating. So I'm happy that the last story with the Sixth Doctor is a high rating. And you're probably happy too. Now, what is my final verdict on the entire set, The Sixth Doctor Last Adventure? It's a wonderful release for Colin, and it lived up to the hype. Of course it would get hype because it's a very special release for Colin. And it delivers. It's brilliant. The Red House, yeah, I'll forget about it. But the other three stories are absolutely magnificent. Red House is in fourth place with a 5 out of 10. I just find it average. I don't really like that one. Third place is The Brink of Death with an 8 out of 10. Enjoyed it. Absolutely brilliant. Second place is The End of the Line with a 9 out of 10. Very clever story. Very creepy and some great atmosphere. And first placed Matt Fitton's Stage Fright. A very, very good story and my favorite from the set so then one thing to do now about the last adventure what is my final rating of the entire set a lot of people have gave it 10 so it's got a lot of positive ratings which is great i haven't seen a negative review on it and i don't think i really will pretty much only the red house i've only seen but that's it it's just a stunning release and it gets a well deserved 8 out of 10 a rating which it absolutely deserves. Really good. I definitely recommend you pick this one up. If you want to get an early order from the Big Finish website, I'll place that in the description down below. But if you want to wait for well, quite a while, it will be released on Amazon on the last day of September, which I'll also place in the description. That has earned the number one pre-orders, I think, on Amazon. So that's great. And I'm not surprised either. So that was my review of The Last Adventure. It's been quite exhausting, but good old Con has put me through it. But yeah, I really enjoyed recording this video and I cannot wait to edit it. It's going to take a very long time to do all that process and upload it. So yeah, that's it. If you got The Last Adventure, what's your favourite story and what would you rate it? Place it in the comments down below. And I will see you in the next one for the showcase series for August 2015. I got something very snazzy to show you in that. So of course, I will see you in the next one. Goodbye and have a good one.